Oh, oh, so much revision. There is so much revision. How am I going to get it all into my head in such a condensed and quick way? I have a brilliant idea. Let's make another psychology videos, guys. Yes, from the requests of maybe three or four people, which is probably the entirety of my subscriber base, I am here to do another psychology video. Now, what is needed for a geezer psychology video? Three things. A booklet that I can read out of and cheat that's a bit creased. The ever mighty sunglasses of doom. So, without further ado, we're going to be doing the most exciting of uh, psychology topics. Research methods! That's the wrong way round on the bloody camera. And uh, every day in the next three or four weeks, seeing as all my exams coming up soon, I will be doing a different topic. So, let's start with the research methodnessness. Right, psychology research and research in general needs to be based on the scientific method. There are four major features of, you know, um, some kind of study being scientific. The first of which is empiricism, which is a view su that suggests that we must see or experience something in order to develop our knowledge. Experience or evidence arises out of experiments, not intuition or revelation. So we don't just assume something happens, we actually test it out. That's empiricism. Um, the second feature is it has to be rational, that means it's based on reason. They have to be consistent with known facts and following rules of logic. For example, I couldn't just make up a theory that says all ducks like the colour purple, because, as we all know from previous research, uh, the colour purple makes ducks very angry. Uh, the third um, major feature of psychology on scientific stuffnessness great word by the way, use that in your exam, is it has to be objective and that, refuse, uh, that refers, I apologise, the view is being based on observable phenomena and not on personal opinion, prejudices or emotions. So that means we can't have evidence that is like, I hate children, so therefore in my evidence, children are the devil. That would be an unobject, that would be an objective, um, and yeah, that would be objective, yeah. And I'm just going to do that my hair because I have to. And uh, the study of um, the evidence has to be replicable, which means it needs to be able to be redone easily. Yeah, so that's the major features of science. Another thing that uh, evidence has to be is falsifiable. Falsifiability is the ability to show that a theory is false. Now, it should always be possible to demonstrate that a theory is false. A good theory is refutable. If a researcher tries to disprove a theory but cannot, then the theory itself is strengthened. Because if we can't disprove it, then obviously it has a certain level of weight. Yet, if there is a study that w we could just say it was like... I, I can't really explain this, so I'm just going to dance around a little and move on to the next topic. Uh, now, a researcher or a scientist called Popper suggests that scientific progress, that science progresses in a gradual and logical fashion. Theories are continually modified or replaced in light of new evidence. Choices between competing theories are made on the basis of which explain the available evidence best. So falsifiability is used to pick what evidence is actually, you know, good. This is, if it's strong evidence, then it has falsifiability. Just remember that. If it's strong evidence, it is falsifiable. And I'm just going to turn the page. Now, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, is psychology a science? Now, there are criticisms to, of this idea that psychology is a science, so should we really be, be testing it in the scientific method manner? Um, one of the first things is that um, psychologies interact with things. For example, if you're a physicist, you don't interact with the electricity that you are studying, whereas if you're a psychologist, you are interacting with that person. So, you cannot study people in the same way you can study physical phenomena such as electricity so that is a problem with calling psychology a science uh, the second thing is that it's often done in laboratory research now conventional research tends to study people in unnatural conditions in in other words, people were treated as if their behaviour can be isolated from the social context. In reality, what is being studied is the unusual behaviour of psychological laboratories. Now, if you're going to go and do a study in a lab experiment, you're not in your own natural environment, and obviously you will be showing a different level of behaviour because you are in an unnatural place, and therefore you're just finding things a bit... You know, we all, we've all been to like job interviews like in a office or a very formal environment and we've acted very differently to the person we are. We often become very introvert even when we are extroverted 
personalities and that means that psychological research might not actually give a definitive answer on what our behaviour in certain social contexts may be as we are often doing research in laboratory experiments. Now the third is passive participants. Now the emphasis on recording one aspect of behaviour ignores the subjective experience of participants. They are not asked what else they think or feel. And any information gained is likely to be subjective. So we, don't, we can't figure out what a person is actually thinking at that time. And they may do things that they wouldn't normally do, so we're not actually studying information as we should do really. And lastly, uh, objectivity is actually a myth. Past experiences, beliefs and ideas make it impossible to be truly objective about the data from a study. Psychologists face the additional problem of studying people and are therefore gathering information in a social context. So, everyone has their own opinions and beliefs. For example, some people believe that teenagers will stab you just for looking at you funny and that would jade their overall opinion when they are starting psychological research, especially if they're going to uh, look at uh, adolescent behaviour so that could make it so that psychology isn't really a science because it doesn't really fit into these four major features. Now we're going to now look at the role of peer review. Now peer review is important in science um, it helps us determine whether an article is of sufficient quality and appropriate content uh, it helps take away false or plain wrong articles. It's also used to check that the findings of an article have not been faked. And lastly, it allows the study to be replicated for the findings to be checked. Now, peer review, I know I didn't explain it before, but it's kind of obvious. It's just having another psychologist looking through your research to check it's all right before it's published. It, um, all psychological research has to go through this to be able to work. Now, to evaluate peer review... Um, most findings build on previous knowledge and theory, and research which does not fit with the previous theory is often chucked out. So, we might have something that's found that's completely valid, but because it isn't agreeing with research that is already there that could already be false, we don't actually get it through peer review, meaning that credible studies are getting left out. Uh, there's quite a lot of bias in peer review. There's uh, especially been quite a lot of gender and uh, institutional bias, which means that like, female studies might not get passed as often as male studies, and studies that are produced in maybe Oxford University that aren't as valid may get passed through, whereas a very valid, um, a very valid study from Bolton University wouldn't get put through. And lastly, there is something called file draw phenomenon, which is many articles which find negative foundings. Foundings, yes, men negative foundings. Negative findings are often not published. Uh, if positive findings are being published and negative ones are not, it kind of distorts the understanding of the topic. So we don't really have a definitive answer of just because we have negative results doesn't mean that it is a failed study. Uh, I'm going to find the next thing. Let's look at independent and dependent variables now. In an experiment, there will be an independent variable, or IV as I may call it, and a dependent variable, a DV as I may call it. The independent, the IV, you know, because it's easy to say IV than independent. The IV is the cause variable and dependent is the effect variable. In other words, the independent variable is the one which is changed slash manipulated by the researcher. The dependent variable is the one which is measured at the end. One way to remember this is that the dependent variable depends on the change to the independent variable. Um, there are also extraneous variables. Now, these are variables which may affect the DV other than the IV. Uh, for example, if you're testing how well men and women can remember events from pantomime, let's say, EVs could include distance from the stage, interest in the play, age, eyesight, etc., gender, tiredness, other things like that. If these variables are about the characteristics of the pa participants themselves, they're called participant variables. If they are about the environment around them, they are called situation variables. Um, so that's all you really need to know about the variables. Just be able, just remember that the independent variable is what is often manipulated to see if it can find a specific effect on the dependent variable but that is often only done in laboratory experiments as natural and field experiments as you'll find out later don't often do that and I look like a twonk when I look in the camera there. So next we'll look at um, hypotheses. Now a hypothesis is a clearly stated precise prediction about what you expect to find in a study for example, I don't know, plants may grow bigger if you put miracle grow on them. Let, let, that, that is a directional hypothesis. A directional hypothesis is a hypothesis that states there will be a difference between uh, two sets of results, like the previous um, 
from, uh, example I just gave. A non-directional hypothesis is a, uh, states that there will be a difference between the results, but not what that difference will be. For example, there will be a difference between boy and girl's examination results. Lastly, there is a null hypothesis, which is simply one which states that there will be no relationships between the two variables that have been studied. So yeah, there are their hypotheses. Well, let me just f find the right page. Now I'm going to look at sampling. Now there are three types of sampling that are often used in psychological research. Firstly, there's random sampling, and this is a sample where each person in your target population has an equal chance of being chosen. There is opportunity sampling, which is a sample where people are chosen as they are most convenient people to use. For example, if, there's, if you want five people's opinion on, I don't know, Megan Fox's body, then, and you were walking down a busy high street, then you'd pick the five people that, you, you know, that, this is obvious, it's just the ones that are most opportune to you at the moment. And lastly, there is volunteer sample, which is a sample where the part people just choose themselves, really. It also... It is also called self-selected sampling. So, for example, if I wanted to find 10 people to tell me about their experiences at college, I could go into a college classroom and ask, you know, can five people come and tell me what they think about their college or stuff like that. Now, um, now random samples have, well, each of these samples have strengths and weaknesses, and I'll just read them out right now. A random sample, the strengths include it reduces participant variables, there's, you can get more representatives, and there's no bias slash generalization to populace. Uh, there, there are limitations. Uh, you may end up picking an uneven sample. For example, you may oh, my, maybe 16 women apply for the post, and then 216,000 men apply. So then you've got a really unbalanced, um, you've got a really unbalanced sample. Uh, well, not sampled. Really unbalanced. Yeah, sample. What? And then you might get low population validity in your study. And it's also very time consuming compared to the other sampling methods. And at opportunity sampling, uh, it's convenient and less time is spent on the research. It's because we're just picking people out as we see them. But it, you, again, you may not get a representative sample and there's not an equal chance for everyone to be chosen. Uh, and lastly, but not leastly, there's volunteer sampling. Wait, no, I'm no, I was talking about random sampling earlier. Yeah, so if I'm just picking people out at random, I apologise, I cocked that up majorly. So if you're doing a random sample, you may just pick out lots of random people and you may get an unrepresentative sample. Now, volunteer sample, you would have thought I would have read this, that um, it's convenient for the researcher and you know they're willing to take part. But again, there's low population validity as you may end up getting an unrepresentative sample. And the people who are applying to be in your psychological study are probably going to have more of an extrovert personality, meaning that they're... Well, you're not going to find out if a person that is a bit introvert is going to get the same results. Uh, let me find... Oh, God, here we go. So, how does psychologists decide which method to use? Now, is the research designed to produce descriptive data or to investigate links between variables? Well, if it's links, then we ask ourselves, do we want to investigate relation or causal links? If it's relational, we use a correlation. If it's causal, we use an experiment. If the answer to the first question is descriptive, do you want to study the behaviours of groups or individuals? If it's individuals, you use a case study. If it's groups, the next question is, do you want to get information through watching behaviour or using self-report? If it's watching, then we go on to do an observation. If it's on self-report, the next question, do you need to get a large number of responses or detailed information from a smaller number? If it's detailed, then it's just an interview to you know, one-to-one -one interview, and then a large scale is a survey or a questionnaire. So pretty much, if you're a psychologist, there are five main types of experimental method that you would use. There's interviews, surveys slash questionnaires, observations, correlations or experiments, and case studies, so that's six. I'm so good at counting, guys. You can trust me for your psychological needs. Now we're going to um, examine self-report techniques now. The two most common self-report techniques are questionnaires and interviews. The strengths of questionnaires are it's an easy way of collecting information and it's more cost and time effective for the experimenter. Also, you can get a larger sample rate. This means that the population validity will be increased as more people will have been asked. The limitations, however, are you may get a low return rate and it may make the overall sample unbalanced because if, if like you've handed it out to 50 women and 50 men and all 50 women answer and only one man answers then you know the overall sample of your answers is well unbalanced and people may give untruthful answers 
because they want to look socially desirable, like if they're asking a really awkward question, then they may not answer it correctly, or they may not answer it truthfully in order to look socially desirable to the people that they are talking to. Uh, interviews. The strengths of interviews are questions can be clarified, which means we can get more detailed results. So, for example, if we're asked to, if we ask someone a question, we can press further on to find out more, so we get more detailed answers. And it allows the participants to freely express themselves, which means they're not just, you know, being restricted to ticking a box or something. And the limitations are, it's more time consuming compared to questionnaires, meaning less participants may be asked, which, you know, takes away validity. And the answers given may be unstructured, meaning it's difficult to, you know, or to determine the overall causes of why something happens. So we've examined questionnaires and interviews, let's now go on to case studies. Now a case study is an in-depth study of an individual or a group. In a case study, information can be gathered from a range of sources including observations of the person, medical records, interviews with the participant, family members, friends and any other source which allows the research to build up a detailed record of the individual. A case study is often used in psychology to find out about interesting or unique behaviour. For example, case studies have been used to study people with mental illnesses, brain injuries, disabilities, memory defects and developmental problems. Case studies are also used for studies that would be unethical to reproduce. For example, there is a study about a man who had a railroad spike that shot straight through his, his head and took out part of his frontal lobe and he survived. Now it's very unethical for us to go and reproduce that but because that has happened, he can be used as a case study if we have gained the informed consent from his families. Uh, firstly, well, case studies allow us to understand not just about the behaviour of a normal person, but also how particular illnesses or injuries and defects can affect our behaviour. They also allow our psychologists to investigate a scenario which would be unethical to recreate, which I've already just said. Uh, next we have observations. Observations involve watching human behaviour, which I was going to make a joke about pedophilia. However, in a psychological study, this needs to be carried out without bias in a very structured, objective way. The two major categories of observation, naturalistic and controlled. This relates to the environment in which the observation is conducted. A controlled observation will take place in a laboratory or other settings which has cre been created by the user. A naturalistic observation will take place out in the real world, in a natural environment. When designing a structured observation, you need to ensure you have specific behaviour categories to look out for. For example, if we are looking at, chil at children's aggressive behaviour, we should look out for things like crying, punching, kicking, um, not being able to share properly, things like that. Uh, as more precise behaviours we could look out for, you know, if we're looking for more precise behaviours, we have an easier way of writing things down and then we're defining what an aggressive act is. Uh, if we just looked out for aggression, it may be that different people have different interpretations of aggressive behaviour as well, so we could end up missing out on some aggressive behaviour just because some of our observers don't think that that is necessarily an aggressive act. Uh, there are several pro problems with the validity and reliability of observations. A major one is observer bias. This is the tendency we have to see certain behaviours if we are told to look out for them. Now, there are several ways to create a, a more valid and reliable observation. The first technique is using a double blind technique which is where the experimenter and the participant uh, do not know the hypothesis. It improves uh, validity and reliability because it causes a decrease in the amount of demand characteristics and observer bias results. Demand characteristics are, are if the participant finds out what happened, what are, yeah, what your hypothesis is then they may purposefully try to ruin the results of the study just because they're an asshole really. Um, the second technique we can use to improve observations is a pilot study which is a test carried out before the actual experiment to see to, yeah, to see if there are any problems or issues with our ob observers. Uh, it allows possible flaws with the experiment to be found out and changed to make a more reliable experiment. Uh, lastly we can use two or more observers well, it just allows two different opinions. Check behaviour categories, produce consistent results is how it improves it. Um, let's go to, on to correlations now. Now, along with experiments, a correlation is a method used to investigate whether links between two variables uh, actually exist. A positive correlation is one where, uh, where one variable increases, so does the other. For example, the more cigarettes you smoked per day, the higher likelihood you have of developing a lung-related disease. Uh, a negative correlation is where, as one variable increases, the other decreases. The more absences from school, the lower your exam score. 
Uh, a statistical measure for the strength of a correlation is called a correlation coefficient. The results in a value from minus 1 to plus 1. So if it's a plus 1, then it's a very high positive correlation. If it's minus 1, then it's a very high negative correlation. Uh, people often assume that if there is a correlation between two variables, that one causes the other. However, a correlation might suggest a link between the variables, but it is invalid to conclude that one variable causes another from a correlation. Only an experiment can is fully establish a cause between two variables. Now one strength of a correlational study is that it allows us to establish a relationship between two variables, which means we can then investigate whether this is a causal relationship using a more controlled study. For example, the early findings on the link between smoking and lung disease were correlational. This established that there seemed to be a link between the two variables. More scientific experiments have later established that smoking causes these lung diseases. Therefore, correlations are useful in the early stages of forming a theory. Uh, another strength of a correlation is that it allows us to investigate variables which would be unethical to experiment on, like the lung disease one, once again. However, one limitation is uh, as mentioned earlier, it cannot establish that one variable causes another. So there could be extraneous variables that aren't discussed that are actually causing the change. It doesn't give a concrete you know, idea of whether this is true or not. Uh, we're going to move on to experiments now. Uh, experiments are the most scientific research method. They involve altering an independent variable to see the effect on a dependent variable, proving the actual relationship between the two. Uh, the ideal situation is that experiments are conducted in an environment which can be controlled by the researchers, such as a laboratory, so we can reduce the amount of extraneous variables which could affect the results of the study. Um, correlations and experiments are the two research methods which investigate relationships between variables, yet only experiments can demonstrate them. Now we're going to move on to the different types of experiments now. Firstly, we have lab experiments. Now the key feature of a lab experiment is that it allows researchers to change or manipulate an independent variable and that it is conducted in a setting where the researchers have control of the IV and extraneous variables. Uh, the controlling of the setting would allow the researchers to be able to be sure that the IV has caused any change in the DV. Uh, it would make it easier for us to replicate the studies of uh, it will be easy to replicate the study pretty much and it isolates and I accurately measures variables to test causation. There are some problems with uh, lab experiments however. It lacks ecological validity as we may be performing unnatural behaviour because we are in an environment we aren't really confident in and we we just act differently. There's also social desirability. We could try and look more socially desirable because we're trying to, you know, we're acting differently in this environment, and I just got a text, which is awesome. Which is ironic, because it was they, the text I just got was someone asking me a psychology question. You couldn't write it! Well, you could, but you'd be stupid to. And <laughs> next we have field experiments. Now, the key feature of a field experiment are that the researchers change or manipulate an independent variable, and that it's con conducted in a real-world setting. For example, if studying children's social development, the study might take place in a nursery. Now the benefits of the real world setting are, behaviour should be more ecologically valid since it is in the setting where the person usually lives their life and it should be a more accurate ref reflection on a person's normal behaviour. And often participants are less aware that they are being studied, which means there would be no demand characteristics because they're more comfortable in their surroundings, you know, they're more liable to just act normally, let's just say. There are some problems with field experiments, however. The lack of control over the setting and therefore potential extraneous variables means we cannot be sure changing the IV has caused any change in the DV. Uh, failing to gain consent from participants is unethical, so you need informed consent, basically. Um, field experiments are more difficult to replicate, and so it's harder to test the reliability of research methods compared to when conducted in a lab. And lastly, it's more difficult to gain a random sample, and so the results may lack population validity. The third type of experiments, which is the last that we have to learn about, is natural experiments, which are similar to field experiments, yet they usually take, as they usually take place in a real world environment, but the key difference is that the researcher do not, does not control the independent variable, rather than they measure the effect of an independent variable which is naturally occurring, such as age. Now, the benefits of the real world setting are the ones that were stated above. Um, but there are problems with natural experiments. Now, the lack of control over the setting and variables means we cannot be sure changing the IV has caused any change in the DV. Uh, and just the same old things that were said for the natural experiments, really. Uh, let's pass all these because you don't need to learn these. 
Ah, we'll look at experimental designs. In an experiment, researchers need an experimental condition and a control condition to know that the manipulation of the IV has caused a change in the DV. There must be something to compare it with. For example, you might want to test whether exercising three times a week improves people's scores on IQ tests. You need to have a baseline measure of IQ test scores without exercise to compare to the with exercise scores. This is the control condition. The experimental condition is the one where the IV has changed to see if it affects the DV. Uh, ex experimental designs just means how you organize your control and experimental conditions. Now there are three main ways to do this. Uh, the first design is repeated messes, repeated measures, don't put messes in your exam, which use the same group of participants in the experimental and control conditions and compare their scores in each condition. For example, in the study above, test them after a month with no exercise and after a month exercising three times a week. Uh, the second is independent groups, which is where we use different groups of participants in the experimental and control conditions, then compare the scores together, pretty much. Uh, and lastly, but not leastly, we have match pairs, which is using different groups of participants in the experimental and control conditions, but use participants that are similar in like gender, age, height, build, intelligence, things like that. Uh, now to evaluate, we'll, go, we'll start with independent groups first. Now the strengths, there's no order effects. It reduces the chance of demand characteristics and we can use the same stimulus material for both groups. Uh, limitations, there are participant variables. Participants may have varying levels of intelligence or some kind of factor and it may reduce our results. And more participants are required to get good population validity. Um, and how we can deal with these limitations, it's, it's absolutely crucial that participants are randomly allocated the different conditions so that the participant variables will, because each independent, you know, if we're having dumb person, smart person, dumb person, smart person via random sampling, then overall our random sample willing, our sample will be less unbalanced, let's just say. Uh, next we move on to repeated measures. Uh, participant variables are um, eliminated, which is a positive, of course. And we use fewer participants because it's sometimes difficult to get people to participate in research, so it's less time and cost effective. Uh, there are a few limitations, though. There's demand characteristics. Like if a P figures out, well, if a participant, sorry, figures out the hypothesis, they may choose to sabotage the results because they're a bit of a dick. Uh, order effects. Uh, it may not be a change because of the IV, it may be the fact that it's the second time round. So order, f order effects are, if we do a, um IQ test in the morning and the afternoon, uh, we, we may be worse because we're more tired in the afternoon and we've already done an IQ test. So it's not actually checking if the IV is giving a complete, you know, na 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 na, you know what I mean. And we can, and there are investigator effects. So if the researcher knows the hypothesis, he may reveal it to the participant without knowing. Uh, to deal with this, we can use the single blind technique, which is not allowing participants to know the hypothesis. Um, counterbalancing, which is when using repeated message, me I keep saying messages, measures, and sure half of the participants do the experimental condition first, and half do the control condition first. So therefore, if there are other effects, it's not as important as we have once to um, compare each two. Uh, lastly, we can also use the double blind technique as well, which I've already told you about. Um, lastly, we have match pairs. The strength of this is there's no order effects, and uh, it's a good attempt at controlling participant variables. Limitations is it's difficult to match participants exactly, so we may not be getting exact match pairs, and more participants are required. And uh, we can we can use identical twins often in these kind of studies to help deal with the participant stuff. Oh God. And now we're going to look on to the worst part of the entire research methods topic because I'm awful at maths and anything slightly to do with maths. Yeah, that needed the epic sunglasses. Get it off. I don't know. So we're going to now look at the data that is obtained in research. Now, most psychologists aim to obtain quantitative data, which is numerical data, from their research. Quantitative data is easier to analyse and draw conclusions from. Now the other type of data is qualitative data which is any non-numerical and uh, we will learn about how both types are analysed now. So there are three types of quantitative data. There's nominal data which is used when categorising uh, something. The researcher on an item is counted when it falls into this category. E.g. the number of males and females in a psychology class you know, th stuff like that. Uh, next we have rank slash ordinal data. Then this is where the data is placed in order. For example, if we were...
doing a 100 meter race we'd record who were first, second and third pretty much. And then we have interval data that is a more sophisticated level of data. Not only gives the rank order of scores but it also details the precise interval between two scores. For example, again, if we're going back to 100 meter races, Usain Bolt might have 9.16 seconds, whereas I have 13.6 seconds because I'm fat. Although to run 100 meters in 13.6 seconds is actually quite impressive, but you don't give a shit about this, so I'm going to move on. Next, we're going to quantitative data, and this is any data which is in numerical form. Now, rather than presenting all of this in its raw form in, in your report, psychologists use tables of statistics and graphs to summarise these results. This means that anybody reading the report of the study will have a concise summary. Uh, a table will usually include measures of central tendency. This is where maths and stuff comes into it. There are three types of average and there are three main... No, yeah, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. Well, the three types of average. Mean, add together all the results, then divide it by the number of results. Median, arrange the results from lowest to highest, then pick the middle number, and mode the most common result. Oh, sorry, that was a complete accident. Um, uh, uh, measures of dispersion is next, and there are two main measures of dispersion. Uh, dispersion means how varied or spread out the data is. The simplest way to measure it is the range. This is simply the highest value minus the lowest value in a data set. And the most sensitive measure is standard deviation. This involves calculating how much each value differs from the mean, giving an overall dispersion value. Oh, God, I'm powering through. And you don't need to know about graphs. Oh, God. Inferential analysis. Jesus Christ. In order for a psychologist to conclude that they have found a correlation or a causal relationship between two variables, statistical analysis must take place. The purpose of these tests is to go beyond what the descriptive statistics mean and standard dev... Oh, I read that wrong. Uh, to go beyond what the descriptive statistics and graphs suggest and to allow a researcher to conclude whether or not a clear relationship has been found between the two variables being investigated. Put simply, these tests allow psychologists to work out the probability of the result they found being due to chance compared to a real effect of the IV on the DV or a clear correlation. So what level of measurement is the data? Well, if it's nominal data, we should use chi-squared as, as our statistical analysis. If it's relationship data, we should use Spearman's row. If it's repeated measures, we should use Wilcoxon. And if it's independent groups, we should use Man Whitney. Now, for your A2 exam, you don't need to be able to figure these out, but you need to be able to, when they ask um, what type of statistical analysis is used for relationship data, you should be able to say, oh, it's Spearman's row. That's all you're going to need to know for the exam. You're not going to need to know how to figure it out. So, oh, God. Uh, when interpreting the results from a statistical, statistical test, you need to know the probability value, sample size, and whether the hypothesis is directional or non-directional. All they do is compare the value given in the exam to the critical value in the table. You never need to calculate it. The critical value simply means the number you need for your sample size and probability to achieve a statistically significant result. And this means that the probability of the most accepted form is that the probability of your evidence being down to chance is 5% or less. Uh, it sounds complicated, but it's easier to do than to explain. Great that I'm explaining it! And there's sample questions, but I can't be asked to do sample questions. And I can't be asked to do that either. Okay, now we're going to move on to type 1 and type 2 errors, which is kind of difficult. Type 1 errors occur when a researcher inappropriately rejects the null hypothesis. They conclude that the findings of a study are not down to chance when they are. This may occur when the probability of a chance result is set too leniently. They conclude that, there is, that the experimental hypothesis is correct. So that means when we reject the null hypothesis, when we're too lenient. So it's a high probability of a chance occurring, pretty much. Now, type 2 errors are the exact opposite. It's where we reject the null hypothesis because we set our chance results too strictly. So it's kind of easy, but you need to understand it. So, guys, that is the A2 Research Methods booklet in a nutshell. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope this has been useful. Tune in next time when I will be examining... Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. This is Skeezer signing off.